Okay, this is a practice video, so <coughs> here goes. Um, Geiger counter, 101. A lot of folks misunderstand what a Geiger counter and this type of meter can tell you. Um, one of the most important things, it tells you is when you're not in a normal area. So understanding how the meter behaves someplace that you're familiar with and have been a lot gives you data sets that you can use to see where it's not normal anymore. So this word normal is used all across the sciences with very specific meanings and it is in context. You can't just think of the word normal, normal temperature, normal but you can because that's what we're trying to establish. So you take long periods of readings with the meter in a stationary spot and you just look at that data. You see what the peaks and the averages are and learn that this is normal. And as you watch this over time and years, depending on the meter, you'll see sunrise and sunset the location of the sun doesn't matter it doesn't affect this meter it's not changing anything um, from a pure gamma standpoint that's odd a little bit but it means that the gamma energy from the sun is constant and it's actually not that much I don't know what that number is we could try and do some kinds of calculations so normal. Um, if you go look at the safecast.org map, you'll notice wherever these meters were taken out over the ocean, they turn blue. Okay, blue is a low count signal. And if you think about where the bulk of the radiation is coming from, it's coming from rock mass. It's coming from land mass, not from liquid. Because, look at the safe cast map, you take a Geiger counter out over the ocean and it's the average counts simply go down. They go way down. You can go find a number. But it looks pretty consistent and that's why these meters have limits to what they can do. Or that just shows some of the limits, you know. Um, the Bee Geige you can take underwater a little bit. It's water resistant and all you'll find is even lower radiation because the biggest attenuator for most all these particles is the hydrogen atom they like that little guy they like hitting it and messing with it they pick on hydrogen now, don't blame me it's physics so that is pretty much the moderator for high energy particles, almost of any sort. That's one of their favorite hits. And it, it's molecular size, molecular quantity in the environment. So you get over the ocean, all that hydrogen is attenuating all these little muons and gluons and fruons that are running around. So now the meter doesn't have as many to measure. You get back over land, you start to see the counts coming back up to what's normal over land. Now I use the word normal because that's what I'm reading today. It's what I read yesterday and it's what I read seven years ago for this location area. So it pretty much doesn't change. Again, insensitive meter, good meter, damn good meter, but it's just telling you what it can tell you. You have to see be able to visualize, graph, chart, poke, statistics, these numbers to get surety, confidence in what you're talking to. All right, so first we learned these meters are mostly measuring radiation coming from land mass, not from water bodies. It's not that the radiation isn't in the water, 
it's just being attenuated in other words it's running into something before it runs into you or it's not being generated by the mass around you so again water unless it's contaminated will not have many of these radioactive things in it so back to the meter so now you've got the meter in front of you you're on land and you do this thing again you set it down and let it sit still for an hour you're establishing a baseline a data set with minimums and maximums and some range that you can kind of in your mind say oh it's pretty stable or no it's not stable but it is this is what the meter is seeing so it's still counting 30 but here it's 30 plus or minus 20 and over there it's 30 plus or minus 5 go back in your mind and think at the data that you're looking at you're looking at a graph of counts over time and it's pretty much sitting at 30 bouncing up to 40 drops down to 30 25 20 then back up so that is how it works but it works differently depending on where you might be if you're near contamination so if you haven't gotten a hint yet you're spending a lot of time in a single place you're building data sets that are pretty big and hard to manipulate but you need to go back and look into them to see what's it, it looks like what's normal so you poke it in a software package and it gives you the numbers back and you might jog those down you might make mental notes it's on record because you've got a data file so if you want to go back to it you can prove what you're talking to and with seven years of data you can say hey you know here's my evidence and I am the chain of custody for the record so believe it or not but in the conversation you also if I wanted to play I could I could get bogus readings and make a TV show out of it and some people have done that but the show just isn't there the conversation is so all right you're walking around with your meter out there now the meter is showing you one minute averages almost all of these types of meters work on this one minute average so what you're seeing on the display is wherever you were in the last minute so if you walked 40 feet then you just did a volume analysis as well as an average analysis you can change your measurements to a becquerel count or a becquerel measurement because now you've got a volume of activity because you've covered a distance so you see where I'm going you can you can poke at this information a lot of different ways you can look at the slope of the average and see if it goes up as you get closer to something now we're talking about land masses so by getting closer to something um, you're driving towards a state park or federal park federal lands that has a high uranium content there's other elements I'm just using uranium because it's one of the big ones we know about so you're driving towards a site that's been contaminated or has a high natural content of radionuclide so it's an emitter and while you're driving your average goes from 30 to 40 so all right that's what happens keep on driving it goes up to 50 goes up to 60 you can go back to maps created by the Illuminati at the USGS and see that they have mapped out these energies in what are called ternary maps because we mine this stuff we want to know where it is and that's one of those things that guides the miners to where to go make the next mine so your readings went up you understand why 
and now you're at 60 count average in a different area. So you, now you're going to go back and look at that that waveform, <coughs> the average highs and lows. Has that changed? Why would that change? Well, the meter's not very sensitive. You've got to have a lot of data to do any analysis out of it. So you're going to start to look for patterns. You're going to go back and associate the high readings with an area. And this is slow analysis because if you're looking for the next uranium mine, it's not going to jump out at you. It's 10 counts above the background until you dig down and get in the middle of that uranium ore and now you're at a thousand counts because you're in the middle of it. There's nothing with a lot of moisture content between you and the rocks. So the energy levels in general are higher. That's that was life before and after. So now you find the uranium, you go mine it, and remember you get an ounce of uranium out of tens of tons of dirt. You grind it up small, you go into mechanical separations, then you go into chemical separations, and you're talking in tons of earth. And by the time they're done stripping the mine, it's going to be megatons of earth. This is what we do. This is mining, no matter which type of mining it is. So now you've got concentrated cesium, we know is not good. You have waste tailings in the tens of thousands or millions of gallons of chemically contaminated waste. You have materials that cost millions of dollars to separate through all of this. So now you want to sell those off to do something and make some money. And that's where fracking comes in. They need a, a standard granule sized particle to put to make that mud because that's holding up the drill pipe. So they're using the physics, fluid dynamic physics, to physically support and almost help center that drill pipe and keep it on its way. Um, needs to be the right thing so it's low abrasion and doesn't scuff the pipe apart on the outside and wear it out because that happens and then they throw pipe away, put a new drill string down. Um, so the out products of that, just like the fluoride they want to put in our drinking water, are byproducts of huge chemical processes and it's good money to sell those things off and if you think we need oil that is one of the tools that they need whether it's it's depleted uranium which it's really not it's a depleted soil of an exact granular size you need those outputs to do the other outputs to it's the food cycle for the oil industry all right, so back to the meter. So when you're walking around with a meter now, you're getting very general readings. This is your background. Anything you're going to see above that is something maybe interesting. Um, so now you're walking around out in the desert, and you find a warm spot, and you're wondering if it's a hot spot. How do you use the meter to do the next steps? You have to go to the light. You're looking at how fast that is flashing and you're going to use your body as you turn around in a circle standing in each direction for as long as it takes to get a stable reading and identify if you get a higher reading in any direction and you might repeat this over acres or miles or a few feet in order to help you locate the source of that higher radiation the physics behind that is your body is a whole lot of water, 80%, a whole lot of hydrogen atoms in there, and frankly, they're blocking some of the radiation. So as you hold that meter close to you in front of you, you're using it as part of a shield for the antenna system, or the detector system, of the Geiger counter. 
And these are really subtle things. You've got to know how to look at the numbers. Now you might get a screamer where you just get lucky and you drive on top of a dumped barrel of nuclear waste. The odds are very slim. And if it's buried and it rained, you're not going to see any of the alpha or the beta, which is really what that shielding works to. You're going to see all of the gamma and you might be able to catch that hidden gem out there. <coughs> So those are a bit of survey techniques, um, how you use this meter, how you use a lot of instrumentation like this. You do gross samples <clears throat> looking for a deviation, then you come back to an area and you do a finer, more granular pattern search, and you continue on. And you might bring a shovel or you might not. It depends on if you've got an idea what you're looking for. So there you go, a bit of survey technique for a Geiger counter. And take one.